There are two um, live performers in Contact Us. Yes. Um, what's the relationship between the tape recorded music and the live music, and why don't you put it all on the tape? Well, there, there is a record where both are together, but I prefer to consider both as being independent, autonomous versions, the tape alone, and the tape with one percussion player and one piano player. You might have already realized that in Contacte, every once in a while, sounds sound like sounds that we know, like metal sounds, skin sounds, wood sounds, and uh, sounds of a sort, sort of consonant family, etc. And within these categories, well, a performance in a hall with the two soloists shows that they function like traffic signs in an unknown country. There is, let's say, on a different star, all of a sudden you would have a point of uh, an element that you know, a piano sound, and then you refer everything to this known phenomenon. And I think the, the complexity of, of the musical experience becomes even more rich when you literally see the instrument and his action, and this is down to earth, a physical act, as I said, it, it, it functions as something that you can identify, that you can name. And then the sounds which you cannot name and which go away and transform, let's say, a sound which sounds like a cymbal into a sound which sound like, sounds like an African log drum continuously. This becomes even, even more mysterious because you see that log drum and the cymbal and they had never had anything to do with each other up to that moment. And, but then you see that they are just selections out of a continuous scale of possible colors. As I have very sometimes mentioned in this context, it is much more magic to find an apple on the moon than uh, to find a moonstone on the moon. Because uh, a banal object, which is known here, and nobody would even look at it, an ashtray, if you would find it on a different star, it takes on magic. Yes? I found the speed at which the incidents occurred in your music rather breathtaking. Um, is it possible that, do you regard the traditional way that we listen to music, uh, or you know, the music that we're brought up on, as it were, uh, as actual barrier to the appreciation of your, your spatial polyphony, as it were? And if so, what are the implications as far as education of the public go? Well, I have six children. And they pick it up as the most natural thing in the world when they go with me to a rehearsal or when they hear talk about it. Some, do, some like certain works better or not so, uh, so well. It must start in the early childhood. I mean, there's no other way. I had a teacher in information theory, Meyer Epler, the famous Meyer Epler. He said, Beware Stockhausen, it takes at least 35 years until anything comes through. Even with the horses, certain nerves become thicker when you always give, give them the same signal, he said, physiologically speaking. He said, do you think with human beings, it can go much, much faster, just wait for another generation. I mean, certain people are just out already with 18 years. Finished, they are old like uh, others uh, with 90, and uh, there are very few, naturally, who are with 80 uh, like uh, very young people. It's just the question how much everybody trains himself in renewing constantly his ability to, to, to perceive. And, well, it needs a lot of spiritual uh, training to, to remain young. I think everybody has certainly heard about the book The Future Shock the, the, of Alvin Toffler, the, the, the basic problem of the next... 20, 30, or not only that, but let's say of the whole time of Aquarius in particular, will be that most of the people can't uh, keep track with uh, the speed of change. They just uh, get a shock and then they're out. All, all they need is in a skyscraper, a meditation center, where they just sit longer and longer every day in order to be fit for the work. But most of the people won't, won't keep, uh, no, how do you say it? Won't go with the speed of, uh, of evolution. And uh, that's basically a question of, of our uh, uh, extrasensory and sensory system.
Mm. This has probably been touched on slightly before, but I'd like to just dwell on just a bit, and that is the question of the dehumanization in, in contemporary music that some people have been talking about. Yeah. Uh, and, I, and I mean it specifically of electronic music. Yes. And, you know, the two criticisms that have been made are both that the medium itself is mm. dehumanized, like, you yes. know, the sine wave and yes. the others are very bare, sterile. They don't have, you know, the human eccentricities around them that we hear in a concert hall. The second criticism is perhaps a little more fundamental, and that has to do with the actual content. You know, although you don't divorce it from the form, you call it the form, I mean, there is some sort of content, and presumably this is a reflection of some sort of social phenomenon. And the question is, in effect, if this phenomenon is so dehumanized itself, maybe the art is going to die fairly quickly. I mean, if, if the art doesn't have the potential of touching basic human concerns, such as love, hate, you know, these kinds of things, can it live? Is it really valid art? Well, there are two possible answers to what you have said. The first one is, it is certainly a mistake to consider all human beings equal. Between, as Albert Schweitzer says, the ape and the saint, there is a whole scale. And they all look like human beings, more or less. There are other people who say that from about 23 year, years on, that everybody is responsible for his face, for the way he looks like. What we mean by this is that there are certainly very few people who constantly work on their degree of illumination and on the expansion of their consciousness. And we are in a state as human beings of multiplying uh, with an enormous speed. And I doubt if the most illuminated people will multiply ply with the highest speed. Which means that in a very necessary and healthy way, subconsciousness is exploding. And I say subconsciousness, not supraconsciousness. The second answer to your question is a little bit more uh, esoteric. If you have ever heard the name Sri Aurobindo, <coughs> then you might know that there is an Indian sage who died in 1950, who has foreseen uh, several thousand years of human evolution, or involution, as he says. And uh, basically, he says that we are in a situation nowadays which is comparable to the situation when, like in 2001, that's not what he says, I add this in brackets, when the first so-called human being uh, came, out, came out of the kingdom of beings that were not called, or that the scientists or the human beings do not call human beings. Well, we say animals. There is nowadays even... Uh, controversial talk about the fact if not the human beings have been a special breed from the beginning on. Nevertheless, there is that moment in 2001 where the ape takes a bone and kills the other one with a bone. The flesh of intelligence rises him above the others, though he is physically weaker. Aurobindo says that we are at the threshold of a new cosmic, um, no, terrestrial um, mutation where a few beings, very few beings for the, for the time being, uh, are uh, changing into something else, into a kind of supra-human being. And what you call the, dis, the dehumanizing actually is the fear of the majority of us that they might not make it. And uh, they call this dehumanize. What they really mean, without uh, being able to verbally formulate it that way, is the, not the dehumanizing, but the superhumanizing or the suprahumanizing. 
that jump. That uh, uh, enormous jump. Like from, let's say, from the, the animal to man, from the man to a superhuman spirit or being. And this is certainly uh, what concerns my personal experience, true. There are already beings among the human beings who are in every sense far beyond the rest. And this is clear from the way, not only the way they live and behave, but from what they can do, what they really can do. And uh, certainly the arts reflect uh, this whole process as well. Um, and this naturally is, is a moment of extreme crisis, which is that fruitful moment that comes very rare in the world ages, where everything uh, switches on a new level. Not, uh, excuse me, where, yeah, the consciousness switches on a new level, but not in large numbers. Uh, we might ask Aurobindo why not all the animals have become human beings. We can say nowadays they almost have. I mean, the, the chicken farms are still retarding this process a little bit. But what you eat there is certainly more cardboard than, than animals. Uh, what I mean by this, we have almost eaten up the crust of plants and animals of this world and transformed it into human bones and flesh. And this process will certainly continue with an enormous asymptotic speed until the middle of next century, or a little longer, until we are 15 billion. And then the food certainly will be scratched on the bottom of the sea or produced completely artificially with chemicals. It's of little importance, actually, what we eat. What I mean is that everything is transformed ultimately into human beings, yes. Then there are no animals anymore in a few zoos and in a few photographs. Yes, we still can see them, but the, the principle has been to transform it into human beings. And then the next step is naturally what are the human beings becoming? At least uh, now we can say uh, only very few will make it. And the general fear and crisis reflects simply that process. Most of the, of the be beings feel they have that inner clock which tells them where the, co where the evolution is going, but they can't make it in this life. So that, that creates antagonism and, and wars and, and uh, fights and discussions and God knows what. Extermination, fascist systems, all sorts of things. It's a sign of rebirth of humanity. Yes? Are you writing music for this uh, superhuman minority? <laughs> well, I would say if you all want to belong to it, yes. <laughs> I'm not, writing, I'm not writing music for anybody, which means I just write it because it must be written and it comes into my mind and I, I, have, to, I have to work very hard to, to get it down and uh, then you do with it whatever you like. Well then, since you spend so much uh, trouble preparing and, and communicating the music, does it worry you that it doesn't communicate to a very large proportion of Human beings? Oh, no, no. If, 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 if I would like to do that, I would uh, certainly have been the best imitator of the Beatles. And, I, and, <laughs> and, and, and what they got in seven years, uh, I might have continued a little longer because they would never have worked in a quartet, you may be sure. <laughs> no, that's just the question of if the large number is, is, is a sign for anything. The large number is a sign for mediocrity or even, even, even for, for banality. That's what it is. Yes. How do you suggest we differentiate between um, electronic music and uh, garbage, music, musical garbage? Oh, electronic music, most of the electronic music is garbage. <laughs> There's no question about that, because the most untalented composers have, have shown up in the studios because they had no chance to to compose somewhere else, so they finally they sit in the studio until someone uh, says, well, okay, try your luck, and then there they are, because they believe in the means more than in themselves. They think if they use modern means, it will be interesting just because of the means, which is a terrible error. Are you concerned about this largely in raising the consciousness, level of consciousness, or the broadening the consciousness of 
your next sort of listener to this music, um, so that they are aware of, of all sounds. Uh, it would be wonderful if, uh, there, if, if the awareness, the consciousness rises, but I have said that there are very, very uh, critical uh, uh, how do you say, border, borderlines, and they cannot be easily overcome. So I have no illusions about the future. Everybody, as I said before, everybody uses my, my music anyway. If I break my neck tonight in a car crash, then a uh, little importance. The, music, the people use my music anyway they want, the, the way they want. They are absolutely free and there should be no systems to tell people what they should think about music and how they should experience it because everybody is different. Uh, in that sense I'm an extreme individualist and I suggest that everybody makes up his mind about his life and the world and Mr. Stockhausen's music. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. Some of the things you said uh, made me think that uh, perhaps there is some connection between the kind of experiences which you're interested in and the kind of experiences which some people at any rate have connected with psychedelic experiences. Are you aware of any such connection? No, well, certainly. Everything belongs together in our mm -hmm. present day scene. That is simply another answer. The people who can't make it through spiritual yoga make it through chemicals or try to make it through chemicals. The only trouble is that whenever the chemical is not in the body, they fall flat, which means they just fall on their, on their nose and, and they, they need the chemical immediately again in order to, to keep that level of, uh, of uh, sort of passive uh, and uh, totally egocentric uh, uh, perception. Uh, but what I want is that through spiritual uh, discipline, someone rises on a level which he doesn't lose anymore and which he can then give to others, where he can be uh, really productive and, and serve, serve uh, the society. That he is in a state where he constantly can give. He has a, a surplus production. And I have seen uh, in, in my life a lot of very dear close friends who became almost uh, uninterested in the rest of the world when they were in this state. Yeah. Uh, you find that in the rooms where they're playing Stockhausen, uh, they also tend to be smoking marijuana. Does it strike you that there's a connection? Uh, I can't understand your physics. I don't think so. If I go around the campus and find in the rooms one? Where, uh, where they're playing Stockhausen, yeah. they're also smoking marijuana. Does it strike you that there's a connection between the two? Oh, no. I know this from the, my, my personal assistant, who is an American, and who has described me that he has heard in Kontakte for the first time in his life under the influence, even under the influence of enormously slowed down time. Uh, he has heard things which uh, he obviously had not heard before when he was a student in the composition class, which means that obviously for a certain amount of time expands the pre preciseness and the, the depth uh, of, of perception. It naturally, it speeds up our perception time or it slows it down. And as the most uh, uh, the most uh, realistic futurologists say uh, uh, already around 2000, almost nine out of ten people will be always turned on with some kind of drug, not just with two or three, but you can buy them by then naturally because the individual responsibility for yourself increases with the modern society. You can buy a drug which speeds you up to the speed of an animal that lives 400 years like a, 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 a turtle. Yes, and you, you, you have the perception of a turtle, or you can have the perception of a one-day fly, uh, which means you perceive so fast that what another one uh, needs 70 years for, you perceive it in that time. The only trouble is how long you can stretch the ability of your body, and if you could not perhaps reach such different states of timing and spacing uh, just without chemicals. That is a problem. And, and it will be a terrible problem of communication because you never know on which wavelength your partner is. You just ask him, are you on 400 or 233? <laughs> <laughs> then he says, okay, then, yeah, could, could, could you switch me on too because I want to talk to you. <laughs> you see, that will be the problem of total atomization of the society because fear, that famous fear about which I spoke, spoke if they make it or not, this enormous jump spiritual jump. Uh, this fear produces naturally anxiety in the anxiety and, and they, they want to have 
experience that is described by uh, very famous yogis or lamas. So they read about it and they think there's something and there's something very profound, very important. And we all, I mean, we should make it, but we should try to find ways which are spiritual. You can do it chemically, but it has its uh, enormous setbacks. Our, our body cannot be stretched in any, uh, in any direction. It breaks. Um, how would you advise a non-super person um, to expand his consciousness in order to uh, perceive the sort of things you're talking about? I mean, without using drugs, how would you go about expanding our minds to meet this new challenge you're posing to us? Well, there are many ways. The first of all is that there are, for example, uh, read, uh, there are a million books now available who can say it much better than myself. Read the book, let's say, uh, Concentration of Maoni. You can buy it in any bookstore book and he tells you what you can do uh, for exercises, daily exercises. Uh, and then another book is called Meditation of the same author. He is particularly good, that's why I mention him. And then another one is called Samadhi. There's so much available nowadays in, uh, in reaching these new disciplines which go beyond the intellectual training that we have learned in schools and universities. It's just starting. Yeah. The yogis and lamas you've spoken about who have developed a verified state of perception have done it only by withdrawing from society in isolation. Not Aurobindo. Um, he was a very important figure in the revolutionary a spiritual revolutionary war against the Englishman in India. And Gandhi could only build his whole activity on the basis that was laid by Aurobindo. Oh no, he was, he, his brother, he, and he himself got lifetime sentence, my dear. He sent his brother to Europe in order to learn how to make bombs. Because, and he was, uh, compared to, to, to Gandhi, he was ferociously against the, 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 the German, uh, Germans during the Third Reich, whereas Gandhi was always uh, advising the Englishman uh, the non-violent war, etc. And, uh, and uh, Aurobindo understood quite well, like in the old Indian history, where you see the battle between Hanuman and the demons. He said, wipe them out, because they will be reborn in a much better form than they are there. And so he was a very practical and pragmatic man, and not at all someone who would, who would withdraw on the, on the peak of the Himalaya and sit there and and be happy for himself. That's exactly what his new yoga is all about. Not withdraw, but feed it back and, and try to keep that state and constantly making contact with, with the rest. Yes? Do you believe that there's a natural limit to the development of music beyond which no further progress can be made? I don't believe that there is any natural limit, no matter where and how and when. Yeah. Uh, when you compose or construct your music, uh, do you try to introduce into it any form of symmetry or pattern? Or yes. is this a completely random? Oh, no, 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 no. But this, this leads us on to, to tomorrow morning, I would say. <laughs> Read, an, uh, for example, an article about the shifting of symmetries in the music of Webern, which I have written in the early 50s. Um, the ax axial symmetries and... Uh, and uh, What's the other name? Uh, two, t two plus two. Axial is when you have three and one in the middle, for example. It's another kind of symmetry. Uh, symmetry is by pairs or impairs. Yes. Uh, yeah, right. Non retrograde or retrograde, we say also. Well, uh, certainly, that is very important in all my work. Well, listening to the music we've heard tonight, um, I couldn't uh, find any pattern in it at all. It just seemed to be random to me. Perhaps I'm one of these 999 out No, 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 no. The way is long, as they say, but... <laughs> but fruitful. <laughs> yeah. I have a feeling you need more of this sort of discussions because you, you make me stay here until tomorrow. Yeah, what is... reach the level of consciousness that is needed to appreciate your music. Um, if I were to reach it, would you suggest one to stay there at that level, that, that open to all um, forms of perception, mm. to touch, to, to, to mm. sight and to sound, um, or, or should one switch on to it and switch off? 
during the time one is listening to me, your music. Uh, I, I guess that if you were, well, one is always in this state of great awareness, uh, such as a, a drug might bring to, to you, a greater uh, sense of expansion of time, that it might uh, eventually just send one completely mad. <coughs> oh. <laughs> You see, my music is not so important in this whole context. You are always referring to my music, my music. What does it mean, my music? It's just something that has come into my mind and I'm working all the time and that's it. So yeah, I'm, I'm a myth. I'm a name and if I go away, then they just attack on something that vibrates within yourself when you are confronted with this uh, so-called music. It has a name. So in order to identify it, but that's so like Beethoven, who is he? He was a very miserable person, I must say, as a human being. And uh, uh, his, his, he, he is a myth for something that we are, that is, is within ourselves. Uh, we, we are echoing. Uh, Beethoven is part of us, or he doesn't exist. And in that sense, I think it's only a means. It's like, uh, like a spiritual food of all sorts. And, uh, it will be used by certain people who, who discover a certain uh, identity of what they are and what, they're, what is vibrating. They choose more of it, they like it. Liking means, as I always say, remembering. When I like something, then I discover something that I have been before, that is profoundly already within me. It, it resonates like a piano that you hit. The whole life should be then on that level, not just when you listen to music. Your music is a teaching mechanism. I think everything should be this kind of self-teaching mechanism, yes. Everything. Every talk, every food, every... Uh, everything. Pardon? Sure, have you used the phrase, we come what we experience, one stage. Mm. Uh, is that a metaphor, and if not, what does it mean? No, 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 no. I, I very often say you become what you eat. And only in a bed. Yes, naturally. That's why since a certain, certain time I really stopped eating meat of pigs. Uh, not... <laughs> And meat in general, I mean, uh, it's very difficult to, in to integrate it. Because uh, only very few people uh, transform what they eat into what they are. That needs, you see, that, that what they eat becomes what they are. But most of the people become what they eat. <laughs> <laughs> well, it literally means what I'm saying. You, you uh, what, uh, well, afraid I didn't understand English, if that's the case. Um, you, you become what you eat. If you eat bananas, you become you you you, you oh. become a big banana. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. If you, you eat oh, eat, eat a lot of a lot of uh, uh, cows and bulls and God knows what, and then then, then one by one uh, you become deeply influenced by their atomic uh, structure. You become what they are. <laughs> so you have to be very careful in what you eat. <laughs> <laughs> and and yes. I, you see, I'm defending a new kind of, uh, how do you call it, it, when human beings eat each other? Uh, yes, on a higher level, I certainly would defend a new kind of cannibalism. Because why, <laughs> except it's very difficult to, to choose someone whom I would eat, I must say. <laughs> yeah, but that's, well, uh, you see, the... The people who really were very close to, to the magic force of life, they knew this. They would only eat someone who was a, the best film. <laughs> the best film. And I think the fact that still nowadays at the court of China, they have a very special delicacy, if you are informed about it, that they cut, no, they, for example, they excite apes, monkeys, up to the degree that they are very angry. And in that state, they cut off their skull and eat the fresh brain. That is a delicacy at the court in China. Isn't it? <laughs> there you are. You said something about, uh, um, I think, a mind dividing into two, didn't you? And maybe misquoting it. 
Um, <laughs> divide our, our consciousness dividing into two while we're, when we're hearing things. Becoming into polyphonic two. beings. Yes. You, you Pardon? Becoming polyphonic beings. Oh, yes, I said following two things at the same time. That is what we call the, 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 the cocktail effect in, in, in information theory, which means that when you are five people in a room, that uh, or ten people in a the room, then five couples of two can, uh, can uh, understand each other though they are all talking with maximum loudness. Which means you can follow two lines at, at once. And, and uh, in old polyphonic music, in the Bach piece, for example, someone who has learned to listen better than other people, he can follow two lines at the same time. Or, uh, as many people say, Napoleon could talk to someone and at the same time write a letter. Only two. One. Yeah, well, yes. <laughs> You see, it's already quite a lot, isn't it? But in music, we sometimes can follow. Doing and perceiving is something else. So we can follow up to three, if it's not too complicated, three layers of events. Watching you, I'm talking, my brain is going almost automatic because I see what, you, what your colors are, etc. And at the same time, I, I can still think of someone in Cologne now. How he looks like, etc. I have three things. I'm doing three things for This is like a housewife sitting at home, watching television while knitting and talking to her husband, listening for the baby crying. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I would say... <laughs> I would say the latter one, the latter one is certainly excluded, otherwise she would uh, jump up and, and leave the husband alone for a while. Yes, well, we are all trained daily in this uh, polyphonic new uh, way of becoming polyphonic beings, yeah. Stop yes? What do you think of the effects of living in an, in an environment where there is a continuous background noise, like in an urban environment? Where a normal environment? An urban environment. An urban? Yeah. I mean, what is, what is your reaction to the noise in Oxford? Okay. <laughs> what is that question? Not the noise first. What is your reaction to the noise in Oxford? They come here yeah, compared to London. Well, it is in this hall, yes, but I mean, out in the streets, still corn market, high street. I will ask myself tonight uh, because I haven't, I'm not conscious of it. I have arrived this afternoon. I don't know. Does, uh, will, will, will urban noise generally have on man, do you think? Do you have any opinion on that? Yeah, like all the pollution. Acoustic pollution is, is, is even worse than, than the rest. I'm trying to sue my neighbor since about uh, six months because he has uh, five shepherds and, and, and a parrot. And the par parrot is, is, is uh, yelling from uh, six o'clock in the morning, hard out, hard out, all the time. <laughs> and, and, and I tell you, uh, it, it, it calls out the devil in me. I mean, if... <laughs> I'm thinking of all sorts of poisons and uh, God knows what. You may be sure. Well, it's just impossible. I'm trying to sue him now, and we have just set up already the whole legal case when we go to the court. All my friends come with me, and professors and so. And Kontarski, the pianist, has already uh, decided that she will come and said, uh, may Mr. Stockhausen leave the room for a moment, please? And then they say, why? I said, yeah, well, I have to tell, uh, tell you something very serious. And then, because I want to get my case through, naturally, and we have informed each other what to do. So we made the plan that he will tell, tell the judge that, you see, Mr. Stockholm, since uh, already six years, since he lives in that house, he is showing very strange... Uh, uh -huh. <laughs> you see, he has asked already in, in three, three scores now, in Microphony One and in Momenta uh, as well, and in the new score, uh, the uh, well-trained musicians, I mean, like me, for example, I'm a professor of music, a pianist, to bark like dogs. But, <laughs> You see, he says barking, and I, I think that goes a little too far. I think you should uh, really stop uh, these shepherds, because God knows what he's doing next. <laughs> Etc. Uh, well, we try to get rid of this uh, musical garbage, as I say. I have invented a garbage, dis di garbage disposal device for acoustic garbage, which is the following. I just talk talked about it today. Uh, in every large city, I play Leonardo now. Uh, there, will, there will be microphones in every corner. And the microphones pick up all the noises that are there, the sounds, 
and they will be fed into a computer which analyzes immediately the sound wave and then through thousands of small speakers which are also distributed everywhere uh, produces them in counter phase so that every person who's coming into this, this area he says <laughs> and then, then I say and then they should install public uh, 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 how do you say dressing rooms like pissoirs etc like in France we have them right on the road in, in Paris uh, where the people can acoustically <laughs> see yes what is the right word? You know what I mean? They're there they can say anything what they want. There are wonderful walls like in Israel. The wall of where, where you can really shout against and say all the things and then when you have emptied yourself, okay, then you go back into the silent area. Yeah. Sorry, I have a question. The students asked me if Oh, by all means, yes. Thank you.